So, hello. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Oh, hi. Hi, Gary, Harold, Mark. Hi, Kawa. Hi. Hi, Ruben. How are you? Very good. Thank you. I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, Mark, your your tree stop is here, so you can come anytime you want. Okay, uh, probably okay. Tom tomorrow, will you be around? Yeah, yeah, no problem, yeah. Okay, I'll just uh, text you or give you a call before I come, okay? Yeah, sure, make sure I, I wake up. <laughs> yes, yeah, I won't do that early. <laughs> Thank you, Kawa. <laughs> I'm waiting for... Uh, for John. <clears throat> Hello, Hang. Hi, Mr. Lin, how are you? Hi, good. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is your December 2 uh, still uh, going? Sorry? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, the Dead Valley 2? Oh, going? yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's still going. It's still on. Okay. I'll talk to you later then, okay? Yeah, yeah sure.
Hello. Hello. I've, I've put a shot behind me, but it didn't include the whole shot, and I don't know, I can't remember how I did it. <laughs> so Sorry? I put a shot behind my face. You can see a picture that I took years ago. Okay. I can't seem to get the whole picture. What's missing is the whole top of the picture. <laughs> okay. And I can't uh, remember how I put it in there, and I wanted to, I wanted to change it so it shows the whole picture. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, we have um, two more minutes to seven, but let's wait for maybe five more minutes and um, because people are getting in and I don't see John here. You may have Money to take over. To <laughs> I have to take over, yeah. <laughs> you know the subject. Oh yeah. <laughs> Okay, he says, Ian, John, where are you? Say something. Okay, John is coming because he went to the to the link of our meeting this morning. <laughs> okay, so he went to the wrong hall, but he's he's coming. Okay, hi John, I see you. Uh, you have to unmute your mic.
Oh, okay. Should... Okay, welcome, John. You went to the wrong room, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, 7 p.m. right now. So let's wait for another three minutes because people are getting in. Is okay. that okay for you? Yeah, no oh. worries at all. Mm -hmm. How is everything up, up in uh, Jersey, right? Yeah. Awesome. Everything good, yeah. Still, uh, still pretty crazy up there with the coronavirus and everything. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. unfortunately, crazy, yes. crazy times. Yep, definitely changing the landscape. Uh, no pun intended, of our type of work for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have 90 people. Hello, Pam. <laughs> I'm here again. Uh, hello. Uh, Hi. So we have two more minutes. So those who know me, those who know John, you can show your face and say hi. I guess See I need know. to scroll through all these <laughs> open boxes with faces to see if I recognize some people. Yeah. <laughs> hey guys. Hello. Hello, Sasa. Welcome. Thank you. I see your face for the first time <laughs> on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> so this is going through Zoom and also Facebook Live and YouTube Live. Is that right? Yep. Zoom. Very cool. Uh, Nisi USA Facebook, Nisi USA YouTube, and my Facebook. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Because we have like um, 300 something people sign up. Oh. So, and right. we can just put 100 people in the Zoom. So the oh, rest will be I, in uh, Facebook and YouTube. Got it. Yeah. I'm eventually going to need to upgrade my uh, Zoom service because I keep getting the, the message. It's like 40 minutes and then it's over. Yeah. Mm. Please upgrade. So maybe mm -hmm. I'm just being cheap. I don't know. I need to get the, the right version. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's start in one minute. We have almost 100 people in the Zoom. Yeah. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're going to do kind of a presentation and then questions at the end. Yep. Mm -hmm. cool. Everything sound okay on your end, the sound and video, everything. Yep. Perfect. Awesome. I guess everybody's muted or else there would probably be other people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mute them all. Uh. <laughs> we'll talk later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I will mute all, and then John, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. All right, I think I'm unmuted. Okay, so we have 100 people, so we are full house in a Zoom. Nice. So for those of you who can get in, just go. Oh, <clears throat> they should be in the YouTube or Facebook. <laughs> right. Okay, so let me start. Um, before I hand over the, the stage to John, let me do some, give you some information, housekeeping thing. So let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, so welcome everyone to the, to the first episodes of Nisi online seminar. So today we are honored to have John b um, So just a few things before I pass it over to John. Um, first, just a little bit about John, a few words about John. John b is the US-based photographer, landscape photographer in uh, from Florida. So he started his company b Photography in 2015 and has since worked with clients like Nikon, Pepsi, T-Mobile, the Home Depot, to name a few. 
So John is most well known for his vivid landscape and cityscape photography, accentuation, depths, and perspectives. So aside from his uh, landscape and cityscape fine art works, so he also specialized in in the commercial travel, architecture, photography, and so on. So today, uh, in this seminar by John, he's going to share his top tips to level up your landscape photography. These are the tips and tricks that John has used to produce his own unique photography and create a consistent and recognizable landscape sounds. Okay, so um, so before I pass it to, uh, the state to John, just want to um, uh, remind you that this is the, the first episode of the Nisi seminar series. So we are planning to do this every month and here you can see the slide here um you can take advantage of the the coupon code nisi webinar 15 and then you get a 15 percent off uh when you shop on the nisi optic usa.com which expire on uh, 31st of october okay so um so once uh, once john starts his seminar uh, if you have question, you can either unmute your mic. If you have something to, to ask immediately, you can just unmute your mic and, and ask John. Or we better to leave it until the Q&A session after the, after the seminar. So for those of you who are in the, the Facebook, the YouTube, if you have question, just leave your question in the comment section. I will monitor the question and I will collect all the question and put in a Q&A session. Okay, so with that, I will... Um, stop talking and, and I will leave the stage to John. Welcome, John. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity and I appreciate the intro as well. Um, I'm about to probably go over some of the same stuff in a second here, but uh, yeah, we won't waste any time. I'll jump right into the presentation. So might help if I share the screen first. Here we are. Desktop two. All right. So thank you guys again for coming. I really appreciate the opportunity. And for you guys to show up to actually listen to what I have to say is pretty cool and humbling. And yeah, so let's just jump right in. So first off, a little bit about myself. All right, here we are. A little bit about myself, who am I? So my name is John Weatherby and I'm based out of Tampa, Florida. And I'm a full-time travel and landscape photographer. I have been full-time now for four years. And I also teach workshops. And then as of recently, I have online courses. So also I do dabble in commercial photography, but my income primarily these days is from travel and landscape stuff, which is pretty awesome. All right. Um, some of the clients I've worked with include T-Mobile, Pepsi, as Dr. Lin just mentioned, and Nikon. Uh, I recently had an opportunity to shoot a campaign for the new 14 to 24 lens, which is very fun. It's an amazing lens. And some of the sponsors that I get to brag about sometimes include F-Stop, Bay Photo, Lens Rentals, Photo Pro, and then of course Nisi. So um, this has come from and I'm blocking my notes here. So this has come from building relationships with people in the industry and it's equated to some really amazing opportunities like doing this presentation today. All right, so how did I get started? So I get this question a lot from people and I actually picked up a camera while I was in school and I was working as a waiter. So I started taking up, I started taking photos of the food for their social media. And I actually started off just taking pictures with my iPhone. And as you can see, they really sucked. Um, not really anything special, but I had a photographer come in one day and do photos for the menu. And the photos that the photographer produced were so stunning. They just absolutely blew my mind. And I realized then and there that I needed to get better gear. So. I asked the photographer some recommendations and the photographer recommended a Nikon D5100 and a kit lens. So this was my first camera that I purchased in 2014. It was a birthday present for myself. And I started taking pictures of the sushi and they started getting pretty good. Um, 
you know, probably not as good as the one I just showed you, but they're getting better. And I started to learn different types of photography. So I started to experiment with cityscapes. So this is one of my first cityscapes. And you can see it definitely had a lot of room for improvement. It was kind of cool. I definitely played out the fisheye lens way too much. Um, I thought it was really cool, but yeah, so there was some room for improvement. So I continued to keep learning and I refined my craft and eventually my photography got a little bit more polished and refined. So people started to take notice and I started getting requests for prints and photo shoots, et cetera. That's when I formed this company and I started to sell prints. So at this time I started actually making money from my photography. So this is amazing. This is, this is confirmation that, you know, I can turn this into a career. Um, I can do something that I enjoy for a living and, you know, it's a pretty awesome feeling. So this was actually one of the biggest prints that I ever produced. And this was for an office in downtown Tampa for Cushman Wakefield. So this was a pretty cool day. So how did I get into landscape photos? So I got invited onto a trip with some friends to Iceland in 2017. And I absolutely fell in love with landscapes. So prior to this, mind you, I'd only done cityscapes and architecture and stuff like that. So if you haven't been to Iceland, oh my God, you have to go like as soon as you can right now, it's not possible. But Iceland is like a theme park for photographers, I always say, because there's so many destinations there, so many locations that you can go to literally just driving around the country and stopping, taking photos, driving and stopping. It's crazy. So I go to Iceland and I get introduced to these amazing landscapes. And this is one of the photos from my first trip. So this was High Foss. It's a, I think it's the second tallest waterfall in Iceland or in the world, one of the two, but it's very substantial. So this photo was pretty good. Um, definitely it's still, like I just said a few minutes ago, room for some improvement, but you know, technically good, no blown on highlights or anything like that. Uh, this was, I don't even think this was with the filter. I just tried to ramp the aperture up and I got, you know, a decent shutter speed, but it would have been better had I been smart and used filters. So this is a shot from a more recent trip. And this was during sunset at Kirkjafell mountain. So this is my favorite mountain in Iceland. This is actually the spot that I saw that really sold me on visiting Iceland. And it was, it's just one of those iconic spots that if you go to Iceland, you have to photograph. This is like iconic Iceland stuff. So as you can see, there's a big jump from taking iPhone pictures of sushi to taking city photos, to taking landscape photos in other countries and a lot of improvement in the quality of my work along the way. So how did I improve? What happened? I attribute my successes thus far as um, are from a desire to keep learning. So I have this desire to constantly improve and constantly learn. So I learned online, which is what you guys are doing right now. And my hats are off to you. I learned from paid tutorials from photographers that I looked up to and followed. I learned from trial and error, um, you know, seeing what works and what didn't and adjusting. And I learned from shooting with others. So, you know, befriending other talented photographers, getting out shooting and getting creative. So without further ado, here's some tips that I can provide for you guys for your landscape photos. And hopefully, you know, there's some new stuff in here to you and you get to take away something to help you create some stunning photos. So my first tip is to know your camera. So this seems super obvious, obviously, but what I mean is to master your camera so that when you go out into the field, you're confident in your abilities and you don't fumble over your settings or anything like this and uh, potentially miss some shots. So in this section, I'll share with you guys some tips and tricks for getting better shots. So first up is shoot and roll. And again, super obvious, uh, probably just lost like half of you guys uh, because this is you know pretty common knowledge, but keep in mind that there are some beginners that still shoot JPEG. Uh, I personally shot in JPEG for way too long when I first started. And this is because the raw files were very intimidating. So JPEGs, they look really nice straight out of camera, right? So when you load those files, those raw files into Lightroom or Photoshop, and you see, you know, the preview of it as a JPEG, and then it changes to raw, it's like, oh God, like it looks so terrible, right? So uh, yeah, I definitely took a, a slower transition. And 
what I do recommend for people to do if they are still shooting in JPEG is to shoot JPEG plus uh, raw. So you can see that at the top there. And the reason is because then you still have the JPEG. Uh, so you, that's your safety net, but you still have the raw file to play around with and kind of get used to adjusting raw files. So raw files are going to be the best way to take advantage of image details and quality and get the most out of a single file, or even if you're blending files. So my second tip is to shoot an aperture priority. So this is incredibly helpful when you're dealing with fleeting light, excuse me, or using filters, and you don't want to have to struggle to figure out the best settings on the fly. So you're letting the camera essentially do the thinking for you. And as long as you keep your ISO, you know, where you want it and you create the aperture that you want. So you have a certain amount in focus and you get the depth of field that you're looking for then the camera will figure out the shutter speed for you. So this, you know, this figures out one piece of the exposure triangle. So you don't necessarily have to be in manual and take a shot and then realize it's underexposed, readjust and then figure out that it's overexposed and adjust back again. Your camera will meter for you and basically figure out your settings to get a proper exposure quickly, um, really instantly. So this is great. Also shutter speed priority is great. And I'm shooting in this type of uh, kind of automated method about 95% of the time. And the other 5% is when I need full control over the settings. For example, maybe I'm photographing some wildflowers and they're right up close to my camera. So I have a really high aperture, which requires a slower shutter speed. So maybe I need to ramp up my uh, ISO to get a faster shutter speed to freeze the motion of flowers, right? So if I need to freeze the motion, maybe I'm gonna go fully manual. Or if I want to get a longer shutter speed than what's produced with aperture priority, then I would go to manual so that, or, or use some filters to drag the exposure out further, right? So this works in most scenarios. Um, also, like I said, shutter speed priority, also amazing. So then my next tip is to bracket. So bracketing exposure is, is gonna be essential when you're shooting a high dynamic range scene. So if you have a scene where you have the sun in it and you have you know very bright highlights, very dark shadows, um, you essentially can take three shots. So here you see I've bracketed three shots at two different ex uh, stop exposures. And I wind up with a medium exposure in the middle and then an underexposed shot with all the highlights intact. And then an overexposed shot where there's plenty of details in the shadow and I don't have to brighten or degrade the image um, by increasing the exposure too much. So you can, you can get this you know, exposure right in one shot sometimes, uh, but this is gonna require you to severely underexpose a shot. And when you ramp up an underexposed shot, you're gonna wind up with shadow noise. So shadow noise is gonna degrade the quality of the image. The workaround is to take multiple exposures like this and then blend them back later in post-processing like Photoshop. Um, you can use HDR or you can use luminosity masks, which is the method that I prefer because I have a lot more control over kind of what I uh, reveal through each different exposure. All right, so next up, this leads me to turning on your highlight review. So this is a feature in your cameras and this is either gonna show up as like a blinking light or zebras potentially, but basically in an icon, it's under the playback under the menu for highlights. And now you can see when I play back and I look at this highlight review, it flashes where it's overexposed or blown out. So this is very helpful to make sure that you're not clipping highlights or overexposing. And the reason you wanna do this is because uh, you can't recover highlights as much as you can shadows. So if you see clipping on the screen like this, there's a good chance that those highlights are gone. There's no data there in the file. And when you go to edit your photo, it's very frustrating when you realize that you, you know, have blown the highlights out in your shot and there's no, you know, getting them back. So I've done this um, in slot canyons and stuff like that where I've blown out the sky and or, you know, some details in the actual canyon. And it's just like one of those things you just can't fix. Um, you know, maybe you wasted a, a slot canyon tour if you shot, you know, all of your images with blown out highlights. So the next up is vibration reduction. So this is a setting that a lot of people, oops, sorry, I paused that there. So vibration reduction, uh, some people know this, some people don't, but basically it is a compensation for movement either in your camera or your lens. So I recommend turning this off when you're on a tripod because your camera's trying to compensate for movement. And when you are 
not moving your camera, then it's going to result in blurry photos. So I've, I've tested this with my uh, Nikon Z7 and it has in-body stabilization. And there is a noticeable difference if I take a photo with the vibration reduction on, on a tripod and when I take it off, it's definitely noticeably sharper. And I've done this as well with lenses before. Um, and it's always softer in the shots where the vibration reduction is turned on on a tripod. So alternatively, if you're shooting handheld, then I recommend to flip this on because you're going to get sharper shots from your handheld photography. Uh, and this applies even, you know, with some faster shutter speeds, you know, with a telephoto lens, for example, it's heavy, it's going to shake in your hands. So, um, or flop on the tripod, potentially. So my next tip is to use a self timer and going back, like I just said, even with faster shutter speeds with a longer telephoto lens on a tripod, you know, you could, you think that a, a shutter speed is fast enough that you won't get any type of shake or movement. Um, but it's always good to use some type of self timer or something or a shutter delay. So I actually use a shutter delay. So you can do a self timer, set it to two seconds or five seconds or 10 seconds, for example. Uh, or even 20 seconds, but I use the delay or the shutter delay in my camera to only do a 0.2 or a 0.5 second delay. So it's fairly quick, but basically I touch the shutter and then it's going to wait a second or however long I put for it to wait to take the photo. So there's no camera shake. So as you just saw on the screen, a remote also is very handy and ideal. Um, but if you're lazy like me and you just don't take the remote out 90% of the time, then the shutter delay works really well. All right, so my next tip is to shoot in live view. So what I do usually when I'm on a scene, when I approach a scene is I walk around with my camera in live view and I'm just looking at the composition change in real time and getting you know real time feedback on how my composition is gonna look through the lens. So this is really helpful to walk around a scene with your live view on and assess some different composition elements or options before you sit down and you know start firing off. So um, one thing to note, this thing on the top of my camera was for filming purposes and it has nothing to do with photography. All right, so my second tips for you guys or my second category is to be at the right place at the right time. So you know the camera's now like the back of your hand. You're confident with the settings and you know the tips to get better photos. Now we need to find locations to photograph. So it's not good enough to just be at the right place, but to also be there at the right time with the right conditions. So how to be a better photographer. This is one of my favorite quotes and it's by a guy named Jen Richardson. And it goes, if you wanna be a better photographer, put your camera in front of more interesting things. So this seems kind of obvious, but there's definitely some truth to it. And it doesn't mean that you have to go far away from home. For example, you can find really epic and hidden gems sometimes really close to your, your house at a park or something like that. Uh, an example, in Portland, there's this famous Japanese maple garden with this tree that everybody photographs. And it's just a local park, you know, or a garden. So you might have some epic stuff close by. Uh, you don't necessarily have to go to Iceland, but if you go to Iceland, for example, it's hard to take a bad photo there. So this is a surefire way to take better photos is to go to epic places or, you know, put your camera in front of epic things or interesting things. All right, so how do we find these epic locations? So with the internet, uh, you know, the internet is a godsend to photographers. Also, um, you know, probably it has its own set of problems as well. But my first tip to find images is Google images. All right. So this is usually my first step. I'll go up to Google and I will search for something that I'm interested. In. Maybe this is Utah. We'll use Utah sunset for this example. And then I will look for images that capture my attention or catch my eye. And then I'll click on the article that the image is associated with. And then I'll look for more information about that photo. Excuse me. So this is a way you can find a location from a photo that you just saw that you're interested in shooting. So what's crazy is there's actually a lot of secret or lesser known places that are well documented on the internet and can be found with a simple Google search. So this is so funny to me sometimes because somebody have a question. 
I heard something, but moving on. <laughs> okay. So this is funny to me because people, you know, don't like to share locations and a lot of people like to keep locations secret, but you know, I found some places that are hidden gems that are like local secrets just by doing a simple Google search, I found coordinates, a parking lot, you know, everything. Right. So Google is your best friend. All right. So next up we can use Instagram. So Instagram is definitely my favorite social media platform and where I spend way too much of my free time. And the way that you can find places on Instagram is to search by location or hashtag. And let's continue the Utah example here. I can go to Utah maybe as a hashtag and then find a photo that captures my attention. And let's see. So then I saw in that shot that the narrows were listed as the location. So another thing you can do is engage with the people um, who shots you see maybe if the location isn't uh, mentioned maybe like some of their photos leave some comments follow you know uh, so do the right thing before you ask them for something but then you can send them a message and ask hey this is a really cool shot um you know where is this and you know maybe they'll just tell you to go screw off or maybe they'll help you out i don't know um, but you can screenshot these photos also and you can save them within the app so you can refer to them later screenshots are really good for referring to a photo on location um, where you don't have internet service, right? So next tip is to network with locals. So this is something that I've done frequently and I've made a lot of good friends as well um, doing this, but you can network with locals to find some unique spots. So the way that you would do this is you would maybe find somebody with some Iceland shots, for example, and then shoot them a message and say, um, you know, hey, I'm visiting Iceland. You have some really nice shots. Would be really cool to meet up and shoot. So I've met some cool people doing this, but again, this is the internet. So you have to be careful and use discretion when, you know, reaching out to strangers or meeting up with strangers, maybe to shoot Astro in the middle of the night in the dark or something. So use common sense and definitely stay safe if you do this, you, uh, you meet up with random people. All right, so my next tip is to use 500 PX. So 500 PX is basically like Instagram for serious photographers, very powerful image search engine and continuing the Utah sunset example here, you can look up at people's photos and then they usually have the location and they even have the settings listed a lot of times, which can be very helpful if you want to figure out how a certain shot was accomplished. So one word of advice, don't just, you know, find these people's photos and go and copy them. You know, use these type of search um, tools to find locations and then go and then create your own unique version of that shot. So definitely very popular compositions with uh, popular spots. And I'm not saying don't shoot that popular composition, but also try and experiment and get something unique as well. And I'm guilty of this. I definitely get the popular composition at the popular spots because they're popular for a reason. So let's move on let's say so uh google earth is also an amazing tool so you can visualize and scout locations from the comfort of your own home so this is amazing you can search for a particular area and this video is loading now so you can search for a particular area and then you can hold on one sec sorry guys this video is not playing all right here we go so you can search for a particular location. I don't know if maybe the internet's slow and this thing is just not trying to play or what. All right, here we go. So you can search for a location and then it's going to give you a 3D um, layout of the land. It'll even show you, you know, where you can park and trails and everything, all this good stuff. So you can take it a step further and then click on one of these dots here. That's going to give you a person view or street view. And this will actually show you the view from different points that you know from photos that people have taken so this is a crooked photo shame on the photographer but um you can even look at the compass and see which direction the view faces so for example this is thor's hammer in utah and you know looking at that compass i can see that this uh magnificent you know viewpoint faces east and it's going to be a good sunrise spot and the sun's going to rise in the frame so Google Earth is a very powerful tool to 
do pre-scouting and find locations. I've actually used this in Iceland, which is incredible. So I went to the highlands and I was looking for a particular crater and I plugged in a uh, land mineral logger and I just literally scoured this spot and found the crater I was looking for and, you know, figured out which road that I needed to go down to get close by to, you know, send my drone up. So um, another thing you need to consider is scouting. So first, you know, before you go to photograph a location, it's good to show up a day in advance, you know, even just a few hours to get a lay, an idea of the lay of the land and figure out potential compositions as well as challenges. So this is really important for night photography, for example, where you want to know what type of foreground you're going to shoot before it's dark. Um, otherwise, you're taking shots in the dark, literally. You know, you're trying to find a composition, taking a long exposure, moving. So this is good to pre-scout and also, you know, it's good so you know the lay of the land, any potential challenges. Um, or dangers and also so you can find your way and not get lost. All right, so then the other thing that you need to consider is seasons. So there's, you know, different seasons when it comes to shooting different elements and like Milky Way, for example, is very visible or best visible during the months of February through October, really the first week of November. But, you know, if you're going to shoot Astro, you need to take this into account. You need to plan to go where you can shoot it, you know, during the correct period or correct time. So another thing to consider is seasons. So in the Southwest, for example, we need to take into account the temperatures can be drastically different, right? So maybe you want snow or you don't want snow. You maybe not even think that, you know, snow is going to be a thing in Utah, but it can snow in the winter. And in Death Valley, it can get upwards of 120 degrees in the summer. So these are also things you need to take into account and plan for. July through August, as you just saw on the screen, is monsoon season. So if you wanted storms, you would go during these times. And if you wanted to avoid storms, you would not go during those times. So these are just different things. You should know different aspects of the areas that you're visiting. Uh, again, you know, potential challenges, but also advantages, you know, that you may want to take advantage of for photos for like for example, fall foliage. So a lot of people are chasing fall colors right now. Um, so this is another kind of seasonal thing. And you can use these tools on the internet to figure out in real time where the foliage is peaking. And also, you know, there's prediction maps like this one as well that'll predict it. So this is helpful if you're trying to plan a trip, um, even on short notice, you know, you could check this daily and go somewhere, you know, local nearby or something like that, or buy a plane ticket last minute. So another thing to take into account is the moon phase. And this is really important for Astro. So the best time to photograph Milky Way or Aurora, for example, is going to be during the uh, period when there's a new moon. So you can use an app like PhotoPills to check the moon phases. And so PhotoPills is good. Photographers at Themris is good. I use PhotoPills. So this is what I show in the example here. But we can pull up Utah, for example. We could use the current day and time, or we could jump ahead to a future date, maybe for a trip we're planning. And we can check when the moon rises and the moon sets and when the actual new moon is. So the new moon means that there's not going to be any moon present in the sky. A moon present doesn't mean no shots. So this is a shot with moonlit foreground. Um, also, you can use this feature in the app called Night AR that'll actually show you an augmented reality where your Milky Way is going to be. And this is helpful for compositions, right? So like you can see in this clip right here that the Milky Way rises right over that rock with the bonsai tree. So I can plan in advance to go to the spot. You know, I can scout this during the day and see the Milky Way and go back to photograph this during the, the proper time. Um, that also works for sun and moon as well. So you can look where the sun's going to be in your shots ahead of time for your, you know, composition planning. All right. So lastly, dark skies. I'm sorry, not lastly, there's another one. Dark skies is also something you need to consider when you're shooting Astro. So you can search for a dark sky map and then look on a map and figure out where the dark skies are that you're you know, going to get the best astro shots. So here on the map, you can see in colors where it's the darkest and where it's the brightest. So big cities are going to be really heavily light polluted. And then middle place, middle of the nowhere places like 
the desert are going to have very little light pollution. All right, so next up we have weather. So for sunsets and sunrises, usually I'm looking for like 20 to 40 percent cloud coverage. Um, this is just personal preference. I find those to be the best type of sunsets, sunrises, but overcast is still very epic. Um, too clear is not very epic. So in most scenarios, but too clear is not a problem for Astro. You want 0% cloud coverage for that, but also clouds can add some serious interest to Astro shots. And some of my favorite shots have clouds like this ridiculous lenticular cloud. So if you're shooting in the midday, um, you know, you want to have some clouds. It's going to act as a big soft box. You won't get harsh shadows. And you can use apps like Weather Underground to check the weather up to a week in advance um, with hourly conditions or set custom smart forecasts to see if you're trying to shoot Astro, for example, I have that custom forecast there that I can quickly check the cloud coverage. All right, so these are powerful tools to plan to not only be at the proper spot, but have the best conditions for your intended photos. All right, so next up is compositions. So creating compelling compositions. What are the elements of a great photo? So you've planned your location, you know you, how to use your camera, um, you're at the right place at the right time. Now you need to know how to frame it, how to create something you know unique or interesting and compelling. So these type of elements of composition, you know, they might take some um, conscious effort at first. You're gonna need to look for these things. But once you train your brain to look for these, you're going to notice them, right? It's going to be second nature. When you show up on a scene, you're going to notice these things right away. So the first element I want to talk about is depth. So this is dimension. So this, there's a few things that come into play here, but the idea is to give your photos dimension. So when I'm taking a photo, generally I'm looking for something in the front, the middle, and the background to create some three dimensions. So this shot here, is focus stacked. Um, as some of you probably know, it's very hard to take a shot like this with something very sharp and focused in the front and something very sharp and focused in the back. Also, this was a polarizer was used here to reveal those rocks. Uh, fun fact. So another example in this shot here, you can see that the front is the wood. So we have this uh, stick here in the front that's going to be our foreground. Then the mid ground is going to be the reflection and then the background is going to be the rock with the sky in the back. So this gives the viewer a sense of dimension of the scene. Light and shadow also will, uh, light and elements I should say, will also create depth. So you can see here that this dust um, in this shot, catching the light is really causing some separation and some dimension to the shot. Here you can see that the light rays caused by the fog are also creating separation and give you a sense of kind of depth and dimension in the scene. Another way that we can create depth is with depth of field. So this isn't typically popular for landscape photography to have stuff out of focus or, you know, soft. Uh, or have bokeh, but definitely you can still experiment and get some artistic shots like this. So for example, here, I think I was at F4 and I was focused somewhere over here towards the middle of the scene. So you can see the front of the scene is blurry, the middle is sharp and the back is a little bit blurred, but this out of focus uh, or soft um, and sharp areas causes dimension, right? So this is you know, a very popular technique with portraits and you see a portrait and it looks three dimensional. This is because the background's out of focus and then parts of the face are more or less in focus causing uh, a three dimensional look. So another element that I really love to implement in my photography is leading lines. So leading lines are great because they create interest in the shot, but they also lead your viewer's eye through the scene in a calculated way. So here you can see the leading line in this shot is gonna be the wave trail at Martin's Beach. And this leads your eye through the scene towards this amazing shark fin rock structure and you know this crazy sunset that we got. So another example is this road here. So the elements don't always have to be natural. They can be man-made. And I love combining man-made elements with uh, nature shots. So here the leading line is the road at Monument Valley. And it's gonna lead the viewer's eye into the valley you know, into the different buttes. So this is an amazing tool to really 
direct your viewer's attention and lead their eyes through the photo. Um, here's another example, the lines in the sandstone of the wave. So these are very nat like natural elements that just create these really compelling leading lines if you can frame them properly with your lens. And speaking of framing, um, framing itself is a great technique. And I really love to frame a scene up with the elements in the scene. So for example, here, I've framed up the subject, the sea stacks, the water, the Milky Way, uh, the person that's me standing there. Um, I frame this up with the trees and the foreground here. So you can see it creates this really nice frame around the picture. So here you can see that the mountains and the stars are framed up by the actual cave. So this is a super wide shot in a pretty small cave, but you know, it creates this nice framing right around um, you know, an interesting subject. And for an example, uh, in a cityscape, this could be buildings. You could frame up the sky with a plane with buildings to create a nice framing. So another element is balance. So an important element in a photo is balance. So you want the elements and the shots to complement each other. You don't want something to be kind of heavy on one side, unless you're going for that, you're going for negative space or something that's an artistic choice. But here you can see in this shot, for example, the Milky Way in the tree is on the right, but there's not a ton of interest on the left here. So to my eye, this is, looks heavy, heavily weighted to the right. So this is a better example um, of a more balanced shot. So now the elements in the scene kind of balance each other out a little bit, fill the frame more, and they just kind of work together more cohesively. So another element of balance is symmetry. And this is one of my favorite elements to implement, um, especially with reflections. So symmetry is great, a uh, great way to get balance in your shots and it works really well with reflections like I just mentioned. So I'm always looking for reflections and scenes to cause some extra interest and you know create a really cool effect. Um, obviously this isn't going to work if it's windy so something to consider you know super windy day you see a reflection shot you know probably move along. All right uh, wide angle lens so this is one of my favorite things if you look through my portfolio my Instagram 90% of my shots are with a wide angle lens and most of them are right up on top of a subject with the widest focal length and really exaggerating that subject. So whatever in a wide angle or wide focal length, whatever's closest kind of in the bottom edges is going to be super exaggerated. You know, it's this distortion effect. So these cactus look really big in this shot, but in reality, they're very small, but because I'm right on top of them with the lens, and I, I think I focus at this shot um, because I'm so close on top with the lens. This is going to create this very dramatic, uh, exaggerated effect. So here's a uh, problem that you get when you shoot like this. You're gonna you're gonna need a perspective blend in some scenarios because with wide focal lengths, you wind up with smaller uh, mountains in the back. So this shot is an example where I focus or I'm perspective blended, and basically, you know the foreground was shot at 14 millimeters here and you can see that really nice dramatic effect with the mud cracks but then the background is where i zoomed into 20 to 24 millimeters to get the butte to look more dramatic or more compelling and then i just blended them somewhere you know basically where the butte and the foreground meet in the sea of flowers so this is a really handy technique um there's definitely videos on youtube that you can check out to figure out how to perspective blend. It's not too hard using layer masks. Um, but the last element that I wanna talk about is adding people. So this is kind of frowned upon by some people in landscape photography, but I definitely like to add people to my shots. And there's a few different reasons for this, but they just create interest and they can create interest in different ways. So a small person can show scale. So, you know, this shot of the redwoods here this person kind of far out in the frame. Again, this is me. Uh, self timer is your best friend if you're trying to take self portraits. And yeah, so this creates scale, right? So it shows how massive these trees are, right? Because I got this tiny person, massive tree. So this is really cool to show scale. Alternatively, if you have a person uh, closer in the frame, then it tells a story, right? So it tells uh, story, maybe adventure. So this gives the viewer a sense of adventure and kind of puts you 
in the scene with the person kind of viewing the scene. So there's a few other things to consider with compositions. What is the star of the show? So when I show up to a scene, I'm looking for the star of the show. What's the most interesting thing that I want to highlight and I want to uh, bring attention to? And then what are some other interesting elements that are going to be secondary to help complement that, you know, that star? Um, also, I'm looking for things that I don't want to show or that I want to minimize. So maybe, you know, some distractions or some people or something in the shot. I don't want to show those. I want to minimize them or hide them if I can't. Right. So these are things to consider. Um, also to consider, like I mentioned, is pre-scouting. So you want to show up to a scene early days before or even just a couple of hours before to check out the scene, figure out different compositions, figure out where the sun's going to be, um, you know, pre-plan your shot so that when you show up and the light is just going bonkers, you know exactly where you're going to go set your tripod and get your shot. This is the reason why I've missed plenty of shots in my time. And it's because I didn't, you know, I, I was running late to the location, didn't get a chance to visit prior. It's my first time visiting. The sunset goes absolutely crazy. And, you know, I show up and I'm scrambling to find a composition and I wind up just settling for something okay, right? Because I don't want to lose the light. All right. Um, so going beforehand is important. And also I suggest to walk around like I showed you with the live view and assess a lot of different options before you set down and you lock your composition in. So that's really important that you don't just go straight to your first um, instinct and start shooting. Uh, plenty of times I've looked at somebody's shots that I was with later and I thought that I had the best possible composition at the spot. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. And I look at this other person's shot and I'm like, how did I not see that? You know, so don't uh, sell yourself short and settle on the first comp. All right. So another thing to consider is whether you want to shoot vertically or in landscape orientation. And with social media being such an important part of a photography business these days, having vertical shots is really important. And the reason is because they do better on social media. So for this reason, I shoot both orientations. I'll shoot vertical and landscape. And you can always crop a horizontal shot, for example, but you're going to lose the resolution and you're not going to get as much in the top or the bottom as if you just shot in vertically or a vertical orientation. So using an L bracket, like I just showed on the screen, is a great way to switch back and forth between these uh, vertical and landscape orientations without having to change your, you know, mess with your ball head and relevel it and recenter it on your composition and all that stuff. So very important. I get requests all the time for prints and also photos uh, to be licensed in vertical format as much as landscape. So this is why I shoot both ways. All right. So last up, guys, is filters. So this is this seems like a, a natural time to uh, plug Nisi. I'm just kidding. Um, filters is a very important aspect of landscape photography. So filters create effects not possible when editing. Um, and they can add instant production value to your shots. So my final, uh, so there are a couple different effects, like I mentioned, that are not possible from, um, you know, editing, right? So I'm gonna go over some of these different examples of these shots and also the type of filters that I use. I use square filters personally because of the lack of the vignette and the ability to stack multiple filters on top of each other. And with the Nisi system, you can actually, you know, have the polarizer behind two or three different filters if you have the attachment in the front. Um, so you can stack multiple filters so you can get multiple different effects, right? So the actual holder that I use is a V6. This is a hundred millimeter system. And it's great because it's compact and lightweight, you know, so this is great for hiking and traveling, but it also, it, it works with my um, smaller mirrorless lenses. So I have this uh, landscape CPL version, which is really nice. I, I really like the effect from this, the polarization. And also you can basically just get step up rings with these type of systems and adapt it to the 82 millimeter um, thread on the back of this thing. And then this way you can get one system to work with a lot of different lenses. So that's really handy. So prior to switching over to mirrorless, I shot with this big 
uh, bulbous front element lens and I use the S5. Now they have an S6 and this is going to be for 150 millimeter uh, square filters. So this is an example of why you would need to use something like that with a lens that has a built-in lens hood or a bulbous front element. It's going to require to use usually 150 millimeter systems. So um, unfortunate because they are a little bit bigger and heavier but you know it's just part of the game and these filters will help you really create some unique shots that you can't excuse me otherwise produce so filters come in a different couple different forms we have round filters and we have square filters so as i just mentioned i like the square filters because the holders allow you to use multiple filters on top of each other and also um, there's less vignetting from these these holders bit then if you were to take a screw on filter and screw it right on the front it produces just a little bit more vignetting which you can usually fix in post processing so not a huge deal um, but this is going to change for me probably pretty soon because of this new 14 millimeter 1424 millimeter lens that i mentioned from nikon for mirrorless cameras it's the first lens from nikon that takes screw on front filters and i'm really excited that nisi is going to be one of you know the first if not the first to create this uh, 112 millimeter high quality circular lens or filter to screw on the front. So definitely going to pick up some of these guys and use it probably in conjunction with the holder as well. So what type of filters are there? So we have polarizing filters, we have neutral density filters, and then graduated neutral density filters. So first up, let's talk about polarizer filters. So they're called polarizers because you rotate them to achieve the polarizing effect. So you can see in this clip here that when I rotate the filter, you can see that it cuts the glare off of those rocks there and also the water. So the colors became richer. So here's an example side by side. This is a uh, Studlegel Canyon in Iceland. We have no polarization on the left. You can see some very strong glare on the rocks and then on the water. And on the right with the landscape CPL, you can see very rich color, no glare, and again, rich color and very little reflection in the water here. So next up we have neutral density filters or ND filters for short, and they come in different strengths and cut out different amounts of light. So I use a three, six, 10 and 15 stop based off of which application I'm using them for. So for example, if I want to cut just a little bit of light, I can use a three stop filter and just get a short shutter speed. So I think that this was a 25th of a second and you can see this is the effect I'm going for very quick, uh, but not too quick shutter speed for this wave trail that's receding back. And it's creating this really nice, just subtle blur and, you know, creating this beautiful pattern. Um, so here's an example uh, from Dr. Lin, and I want to thank him real quick for providing a few slides for me. This is a shot at that same beach in Iceland without a filter on the left. So you can see it's very chaotic looking. And then with the same filter that I used uh, for that last shot, this is three stops. And you can see it creases very elegant and smooth look here. So three stops is good for wave trails where you just want a longer shutter speed, but like less than a second. Um, and this is all gonna depend on the light, of course. So next up, here's an example of six stops. So the composition is a little different, but you get the idea here. So we are at Aldi Jarfoss in Iceland, probably butchering the titles on some of these places, but uh, this is an example here on the left. Um, we have a very overcast, stormy day, sunset was a bust, but still kind of interesting, right? So on the fil the shot on the left, we have no filter, 50th of a second shutter speed. It freezes this motion here. It creates kind of a lot of chaos. Um, still very, still kind of cool. But on the right, you can see when we use a six stop ND and we smooth out the clouds and we smooth out the water and we wind up with a very dramatic and more kind of elegant looking shot. So this is, this is a way essentially you can use filters during a stormy day when most people put their cameras away, you can throw a filter on and create something, you know, amazing still. So here's a more extreme, uh, excuse me, example here. So this is again, my favorite mountain Iceland. And this is with no filter on the left here. 
and you can see this is a quick shot so it freezes the motion freezes the motion in the water you see a lot of texture uh, a lot of texture down here in this water and you also see people everywhere right so and then the sky is a little bit blown out as well so that's with no filter and then on the right here i throw a 10 stop filter on i'm able to drag out my shutter speed to 60 seconds and just fyi guys i just just brighten this image just a little bit in the previous one as well because they were a little underexposed uh, but there's no other editing done in them so there is kind of some blemishes and sensor dust and stuff in here but you can see that there's no people so this is a very cool effect from nd filters when you're doing a long exposure especially in a busy touristy spot like this all those people that were just in this previous shot are not visible in this shot because while I took this 60 second exposure, they were moving. So this is a cool effect from ND filters. When you have people moving through the scene, the camera most of the time will not record them, right? Because they don't stop. So if they stop and they stand there for 20 seconds, they're gonna be in your shot, um, but you can edit them out. But this is cool because you, you know, essentially eliminate some of the editing process. You don't have to go through and clone stamp out 20 people. So just another added benefit to ND filters. Um, so here's an example uh, provided by Dr. Lin of how the filters cut out light. So you can see the three stops on the left, cutting out a little light, six stops on the right or in the middle, cutting out more light. And then the 10 stop, you can see the sun is just a little dot, right? So it's blocking out a ton of light. And this is again, handy if you want to increase your shutter speed and take longer shots, uh, particularly during the day. So last up, we have graduated neutral density filters or GND for short, abbreviated. And you can see that there are different types of these filters, but basically just parts of them are darkened. So they come in different strengths as well for each category. But let me go over the different categories for you and kind of their different uses. So we have medium, soft, hard, and reverse. And a medium grad would be to cut out the light mostly from the top portion, as you can see how it's, um, you know, mostly darkened in the top half. But there's a very smooth transition between the top and the bottom in the middle here. It's feathered. So this is nice because you're not going to have, you know, a harsh line in your shot where it, it's darkened and it's very noticeable. This is nice if you have some mountains or something like that and you want kind of a gradual darkening somewhere in the middle around the horizon. So then you have a soft uh, graduated neutral density and you can see in this filter that the strength of the ND varies from the top to the bottom and there's a nice smooth graduated uh, transition between the top and the bottom a very feathered transition. So this is nice if you very subtly want to darken the image from the top um, more so with less effect towards the bottom. So then you have a hard graduated neutral density, which is handy when you are shooting seascapes, for example, because you have a very uh, flat, straight horizon. This is very handy to basically have a hard stop and no transition and basically just line that line up right with the horizon that's flat and darken everything above it. And then lastly, we have a reverse grad, which is pretty interesting uh, because it specializes basically for shots where the sun is on the horizon. So this is gonna have the strongest ND in the middle and it's going to reverse uh, to a little bit more gradual strength, uh, neutral density going up to the top. So this is gonna be when you have the brightest part of the photo at the horizon, this is when you would use a reverse grad. So, the, so here's a shot again from Dr. Lin where we, we have no graduated filter. I'm using some of his um, examples here because I don't use grads a ton. I'm gonna tell you why in a second, but actually I'm gonna tell you why right now. Um, this is a shot with a grad used. So you can see that it darkens the sky in camera and it produces a really nice balanced exposure in one single shot. So the reason that I, I uh, don't use grads a ton. Uh, one is because like I mentioned a few minutes ago, I'm a lazy photographer and I don't like to take out extra stuff when I don't need it necessarily. But basically I bracket my shots like I mentioned a little while ago and then I blend exposures back together in post-processing. So this is how I take care of this like brighter skies, for example. Um, but there are some, some circumstances where you would need something like this and that would be like video or time-lapse where you can't blend these skies later on like you can with images. 
Um, also shots for contests. A lot of contests don't allow blending. So, you know, they, they require the shots to be single exposures. So you obviously can't, you know, shoot a high dynamic range scene uh, like the shot that I just showed you where it has a bright sky and dark foreground in one single shot, you know, and bring back all the highlights. So this is where a grad would help. And this is all, these are also really great for people that just don't really like to do a lot of technical editing, right? So I, I get a lot of people in my workshops that really love grads because they don't like Photoshop and they don't like to, you know, spend a ton of time luminosity masking and HDR blending their photos. They like to get it right in camera. And there's definitely some gratification to getting your photo all kind of in one single shot. So um, I don't knock them. I just don't personally use them that much. Uh, one thing that I should mention is that you can also stack these filters together. So this is a shot again from Dr. Lin. We have no filter on the left. And then on the right, we have a shot with five stops, gradual neutral density, and then a 10 stops ND. So the ND is going to darken the whole image and allow for long shutter speed. And then the grad is going to control the brightness in the top half and allow you to keep the shutter speed the same to get a balanced exposure for the sky and the foreground. So very helpful. And you can also balance, I'm sorry, you can also combine these filters with a polarizer using something like the Nisi holder that I just mentioned a few minutes ago where the polarizer is in the back. You can combine, you know, three or four filters basically. So very helpful. So that is the end of my tips, guys. Let me unshare my screen here. Um, as I mentioned, I think we're going to jump into some questions now. So I haven't been paying attention to the chat box. I hope that Dr. Lin has. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. awesome. yeah. Thank you, John, for, uh, for the wonderful presentation. No problem. Okay, so we have a question from Laurie. Do you recommend mirror lockup in addition to delay? What was it? I'm sorry. Do you uh, recommend mirror lockup in addition to delay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is a great question, and I think that there are, is some benefit to it for sure. So this is just going to further decrease the camera shake. So what uh, she's referring to is the mirror in the camera. So when you take a photo, the mirror is going to, it's going to raise and it's going to lower. And this causes some vibration in the camera. So when you use mirror lockup, it basically brings the mirror up before you take the shot and then you take the shot. And then after the shot, it's going to put the mirror down. Um, so there is benefit to this if you want to reduce the camera shake even further. And this is a benefit to mirrorless cameras where there is no mirror and there's not that extra, you know, curtain and vibration with the, the mechanism. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another question from Gary. I think you already covered it. Any advantage to, uh, to a GND or gra gradient filter in the Lightroom or camera raw? Yeah, so great question. Yeah. And um, I bracket my shots and exposure blends usually but there is some scenarios where, you know, you want to get it all in camera, like I mentioned, a contest, or if you're doing time lapse or video, it's going to be hard to blend skies, you know, in with foregrounds in a video. Um, but there's just something gratifying about getting a single shot in a proper, you know, properly exposed to photos. So I like them. Um, I probably should honestly use them more. And I usually wind up busting them out when I'm on workshops and I'm seeing like, students and other people bust them out and I'm like, oh, I should use these right now. These are awesome. <laughs> so hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Um, John, I think you, you miss a very, uh, you miss a very important things. I know you just released your, your uh, landscape photography tutorial. Uh, and I heard a lot of good feedback from, um, from many people. So you want to say a few words about your tutorial? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. so I, I just recently <laughs> launched an online course. A landscape online course and the course is um, taught in the southwest but basically all the techniques taught in the course can be applied anywhere so it's on a platform called teachable and it's pretty cool because i'm i can add stuff to it so it's not like i'm sending you videos and it's like a one-time thing this is a platform that you can access 24 7 and it's constantly being updated with uh, you know, new content, new lessons and stuff. So pretty fun. Thanks, yeah. man. Appreciate yeah, I, I put a link on uh, in the chat room. Is that correct? Prophotographycourse.com? 
Yeah, yeah. Yep. So mm -hmm. uh, you can see the link there. And then also, guys, um, it's not advertised, but I am offering half off of the course. You can use the code half price, and that's going to give you 50% off the course and you know all the benefits included with it. Yeah, I would strongly recommend and everyone just check it out. Okay, so any question from from the audience? You just just unmute your mic and go ahead. We have a question. Okay, there's a question from Andrea. What if you have the expo? What if you have to expo sure blend and focus stack at the same time? Good question. One, how do you do this when the time is a sense? Two, and how do you blend all these image together later on? I tried to blend my focus, focus stack image with other exposure, but it didn't work. Okay, great question. And I have a workaround for this, and this is what I do for my shots. I'll focus stack the photos all the way up to the shot that's focused on the mountain or the horizon, whatever in the, is in the back. I'll focus those at single exposures, and I'll underexpose just a little bit. And then in that last set, once I get to that last, uh, you know, focal range where I know I'm going to be blending my sky back in from just that last set of photos, then I will bracket three exposures. And then what I'll do is I'll do my focus blending with the base exposures. And then once I blend my focus shot, then I have that last shot from the last um, focal plane or, you know, the mountain or horizon that I'll auto align with that focus stack shot and then blend the sky back in at the proper exposure. Hopefully oh, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a complicated, com complicated question. Yeah. Complicated process too. If you yeah, complicated process, yeah. Not familiar with Photoshop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, and there's one question from Marlon. Do you bracket one stop and five exposure? Like, how do you decide how many exposure you want to take and how uh, how many stop in between? Okay, so great question. So, um, like I mentioned, my kind of go to is to do three different shots with two stops exposure difference. And this, I find I usually get enough range, right? So, if it's really bright out, you might not even use that overexposed shot, right? So. Um, you might just use a median exposure and the uh, underexposed shot for the highlights. Now, if you have a very high dynamic range scene, you can either do five shots at two stops difference. And now you have, you know, an even further cushion, basically two stops even below your underexposed shot. Um, and then two stops above as well. Or you could do three shots at three stops difference. And then in this scenario, you're pretty much guaranteed to get your highlights not blown out. Um, but then your overexposed shot's gonna be really bright, which you probably won't even wind up using it in that type of scenario. It's gonna be so overexposed. And also the, uh, the blending process, whenever I'm trying to blend my shots, I'm usually trying to get these exposures to be very similar looking in exposure before I blend them. And it just becomes a little bit more trickier when you're trying to blend shots that are three stops exposed difference compared to two. So it might be more beneficial to just do five shots at two stops exposure difference. And then you can kind of incrementally blend these in, um, you know, in different areas based off the highlights and shadows. Okay. Um, question from Dave, what was your reason to go from DSLR to mirrorless? Great question. So I actually travel a lot. I'm full, uh, full, before all this stuff, I was basically on the road full time. So travel is, important for me to have lightweight and compact gear so you know it's basically less room that this gear is taking up in my bags i can have smaller bags and also i'm hiking a lot for my shots so a lot of a lot of the shots that I've, I've shown um required some type of hiking too sometimes this can be uh 12 miles 20 miles maybe round trip you know so in these scenarios every ounce counts and mirrorless is going to be a lot more friendly um, weight wise when you're hiking 20 miles compared to a DSLR and a giant lens. So that's just my personal choice. Also, there's new technologies in these mirrorless cameras that aren't available in the traditional DSLRs that have changed the way that I shoot. There's, I mean, I could do a whole presentation on mirrorless and just talk about some of these, um, some of these things like EVF and focus peaking. And I mean, some of these are being implemented in DSLRs now, but there's just a couple off the top of my head, but there's technology in the mirrorless. 
I think that isn't available in DSLRs. And I think a lot of the focus going forward is going to be in the mirrorless. So I'm just kind of trying to stay ahead of the eight ball and shift in that direction as well. Okay. So a question from David, do you normally use specific ISO for some scenes or usually just use one setting? Yeah, great question. So I keep my ISO as low as possible at all times. So the higher your ISO, the higher the grain in your image. So the more degradation to the photo or the file you're going to get. So keep it low as possible if you can. Um, these cameras these days are very capable of shooting at higher ISOs and not getting an unusable amount of grain. So, you know, for example, if I'm shooting a sunset, if I'm shooting the daytime at all, I'm never above ISO 400 probably. Unless, like I mentioned, I'm trying to freeze motion from like a windy, you know, flowers being blown or something like that. And I need to compensate. I'm not shooting above hundred usually. So usually I'm at hundred or, you know, 64 or 80 or something on my, on my Nikon, which, you know, is there's debate if that's even like a real thing, but I'm low. And then even with my Astro stuff, I'm usually using 1.8 lenses if I can. So like a prime lens, so I can let more light in so I can take my um, shots at the proper shutter speed without cranking the ISO up. So maybe 3,200, 1,600 on a 1.8 lens. Um, you know, some, some scenarios will cause for a higher ISO and there's, there's nothing you can do. You can do noise reduction and post-processing. Okay. So any question from, from the audience? Okay. Question from Ruben. What is your most used lens, the focal length? Mm. So I think I, I had mentioned I used a wide angle zoom for like everything. Um, prior to this new 14 to 24 for mirrorless Nikon coming out, I my 14 to 30 millimeter lens basically just lives on the camera. And, you know, rarely am I changing lenses. Um, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. You know, it's good, definitely good to experiment with different focal lengths and kind of push the boundaries and get out of your comfort zone. But for me, kind of my sweet spot is... 14 millimeters. I love it. I exaggerate foregrounds and, you know, different elements in the scene with it. And if I need to, I'll do like perspective blending, but, uh, I love wide angle. Yeah. So that would be my choice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Any more question? What post process program do you use for the noise reduction in Astro? A question from Arlen. Yeah. So I use Nick collection um, a lot for uh, noise reduction. And recently I just tried out that Topaz, um, Topaz Denoise. So I haven't played around with it enough to really give you a, a judgment based on that, but it's using artificial intelligence or AI and it's actually pretty impressive, the results. So um, Define is in the Nick collection. There's a paid paid version that's very expensive and you can still get the free version from Google if you search for it. Um, I actually provide a link and direct, actually file direct download in the course um, because I teach with it and I show people how to get it for free if they want to so they don't have to spend 150 bucks when they can get it for free. Um, so that's what I recommend. Also, you can use you know noise reduction in Camera Raw or Lightroom as well. It works really well. There's actually a filter inside Photoshop outside of Camera Raw for noise reduction too that I use often as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so question from someone called iPhone. Okay, what tripod do you recommend for travel to balance between the sturdy tripod and light carbon one? Yeah, so I mentioned uh, in the beginning that I'm sponsored by Photo Pro, I'm an ambassador. And I need to reach out and get the travel version of the tripod because I have this massive one. It is an absolute beast. Um, it's carbon fiber. So it's not, you know, as heavy as it would be if it was steel, but mm -hmm. it's, a, so I'm not hiking with that thing. Um, but a travel tripod is going to be something carbon fiber, you know, carbon fiber is going to be great for travel and for hiking as well, because it's lightweight and then something smaller but sturdy is important. So don't sacrifice stability with size. I, I would hike with a bigger tripod that's more sturdy versus hiking with something that's, you know, a, a pencil and it's going to blow over in the wind. Um, so the elements can definitely be a factor. If it's windy, you know, you're using a, a crappy tripod and you're going to shots are going to be blurry. So 
if for me personally, I would, I would rather have a heavier or a bigger tripod, even if I have to hike with it just to have, you know, better shots. Okay. Thank you. Um, question from Joe, do you use natural night filters? Yes, I actually, I was looking for some examples on a hard drive, um, to include with this presentation actually, but it's a pretty cool filter. Um, very cool, especially if you're shooting around a city. So your first thought might be that this is for astrophotography, which it works very great for uh, minimizing light pollution, but pretty cool fact: If you shoot cityscapes using that, it takes away that gross yellow tint that you get in your cityscapes. It takes that out of the shot. And in my experience, this is better to do, get this in camera versus trying to remove it later because when you're trying to remove that yellow tint, um, it just causes all kinds of problems. You're removing yellow from the entire image and it's just very hard to like remove that unnatural look versus just getting it out in camera. So pretty cool filter. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, question from Ruben. What program you use mostly for your editing? Okay, so Photoshop. So I'm a, I'm a Photoshop wizard. I love Photoshop. Um, you know, I wind up with five to 10 gigabyte files, you know, just blending multiple pictures and uh, doing all kinds of effects and stuff like that. So I, I love Photoshop. Um, I actually just created a plugin for Photoshop. So this is something like TK Panels or Raya Pro or Luminzia, for example. I just actually created a panel that's launching this week. So um, definitely stay tuned for that if you like Photoshop and you're intimidated by it. But Photoshop is my go-to. Um, I don't even use Lightroom usually because what I do is I, I sort and rate my photos in Adobe Bridge. And then when you open a photo in Bridge, you open it in Camera Raw and Camera Raw is basically like Lightroom inside Photoshop. So there's almost no reason for me to use Lightroom even. Um, so yeah, Photoshop you know, probably till the day I die. I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any more questions? Anything you want to say to to John? Anything you want to ask? I appreciate you guys showing up um, and listening to me ramble for an hour. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. So maybe I ask a few questions when you're here. While you're here. <laughs> okay. Ooh. Yeah, I've seen you, you. You do a lot of plannings, like with with Google, with uh, Google Earth, photo pills, and so on. So, do you primarily rely on just planning, or you are also types of like discovery types of person? Yeah. yeah. Great question. So, I am definitely probably giving out more advice than I actually take myself. Um, I'm very guilty of showing up on a trip with nothing planned and you know kind of scrambling last minute or relying on people that i show up with sometimes even which is kind of exciting um you know when you don't even know what you're going to photograph and you wind up on this adventure with other photographers too it's very exciting um also you know it, it is kind of cool to photograph a scene too without any type of preconceived notion of how to photograph it so if you're researching these locations, like I mentioned, there's popular compositions and everybody shoots it, right? Like you can see the same shot from one place from a hundred different photographers and you might even get them mixed up, right? So like in this instance, I think it's it's health, it's kind of healthy to like not know the, the scene or the location and kind of force yourself to create something unique um, without any type of preconceived notion so I would say it's 50-50, you know, most of the time I'm planning and I'm like proactive about it. And then other times I'm just kind of discovering stuff. I'll give you one example real quick. I actually photographed fall colors in New England last year. And I was traveling around in a camper van for two months. And I spent a good portion of one month in New England. And I had no idea where I was basically like the entire trip. So I have people asking me to this day, you know, where this photo was and this photo was and i really can't even tell them because i literally just drove around looking for amazing shots and just discovered stuff and you know i've after the fact found out like oh you know i was in the adirondacks mountain and this was you know this lake and that lake but 
um, just an example, you can really walk away with some really cool stuff just from exploring, right? And just figuring it out as you go. Yeah. Yeah, John, you are definitely a rising star, superstar in landscape photography. Uh, many people thought that it's a Thank dream you. job to be a landscape photographer because you can travel, you can take photo, you can live uh, in a dream. So can you give a, an advice to, to the photographer who want to get into this career? Sure. Yeah. Be bold. Okay. Be bold. <laughs> yeah, be bold. You, you need to... The people that succeed are the ones that are bold in their pursuits. So mm -hmm. um, I mentioned that I quit my job as a waiter and I started photography. I started my business, right? Like I took a leap of faith um, and chased after this thing, you know, with everything. So I don't advise going into this type of profession for the wrong reasons, right? Like you really need to enjoy it. Um, and it can be tricky too sometimes when you're doing it for work and you're working with a client and you're having to, you know, adhere to their schedule and shoot what they want and, you know, produce this type of photo and like, it can feel like work. Um, so I, I think that it's finding that balance and shooting for work, but also having your own creative pro projects as well, like passion projects and just shooting for yourself as well. But my advice is to be bold and to network. So networking is huge. Um, social media is huge. I attribute a ton of my successes from social media. So if somebody doesn't know about you, they cannot hire you. So it's a numbers game. So if you are on social, if you aren't on social media, first off, you're severely limiting yourself from, you know, your possible interactions with potential clients. So if you if you want to um, if you want to do photography for work, you have to put a lot of photography out. You got to put it out there and you got to get it in front of as many people as you can. And there's ways to go about this, right? With like hashtags and getting featured on feature pages and stuff like this. So it's a numbers game. Um, if you put your work out you put your best work out and you continue to try to improve and continue to try and put out amazing stuff, people are going to notice, people are going to find you, clients are going to find you and you'll create opportunities. And that can be all types of different things in landscape photography. You could be selling prints. You could be working with tours and boards. You can be licensing photos like stock images and stuff like that, or working with hotels or like, there's so many different ways to make money in photography. You can teach photography. Like I mentioned, uh, I teach online and in person. So like there's just tons of different ways to make money doing what you're passionate about if you're creative you think outside the box and you work hard to improve and be the best to where you're hard to replace and, and you're just bold. Right. So like reach out to people, talk to people, network, and just put yourself out there and you'll be rewarded for sure. Yep. I agree with you. Passion is the most important to keep this job going. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, to my impression, I never see any black and red photo from you. Is that correct? Uh, <laughs> do you do any black, black and white photography? Oh, uh, <laughs> no, I don't do a ton. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. But I like, I like it. And for, okay, so let me rephrase that. I don't do a ton of black and white landscape photography, mm -hmm. but I've done a lot of wildlife stuff, wildlife stuff that I really like in black and white. Um, a couple of photos come to mind. And also some of the commercial stuff that I've shot, you know, like fitness photography and stuff. A lot of these different black and white can be very impactful and create like a really like dramatic look. Right. So it's really helpful in certain types of photography to make them create a mood, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So let's take the, the last question from Marina. Oh, we have two more questions here. The first one, which of your photo was the first one that helped you to launch your career in photography and caught attention of big client like Nikon? Mm, mm. Good question. I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, okay, like I can give you an idea. So I'll show you quickly. Let me see if I can just share my screen real quick. Um, the... The photo that got the most attention ever 
in history is a crazy photo. Uh, I actually showed it in the presentation or I showed a version of it in the presentation and I'll find it real quick because it's, it's posted on my Instagram a hundred times. So it won't be hard to find. Can you guys see my screen or no? Yep. Okay. So it is this photo right here. So this photo actually, when I posted this photo, it got featured by so many big accounts that, you know, I, I just got flooded with notifications and follows and it was just crazy. So this is the first photo that I ever took that like, I guess went like viral. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, maybe I did book clients from that. You know, I don't know. I sold prints of it. So it brought work, um, actual clients. I don't know. <laughs> But one other thing that went kind of crazy was something that I showed in the presentation as well as this canyon here. So I actually posted a video of this canyon and, uh, you know, basically every like big feature page on Instagram reposted this video and it was just insane. So um, Instagram is super powerful, guys. Social media in general is super powerful. It's the only thing you know, in this world that literally like somebody can post a video on TikTok now and, you know, be a, a famous person the next day with over a million followers. Like it's, it, it's mind blowing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. A uh, question from Andrea. Do you think a teleconverter is a good, as good as telephoto lens? Sure. So I don't actually use teleconverters. Um, I have used them for some shots, but the way that they work is they cut light and quality out of the shot. So if you're using like a 1.4 converter, it's going to cut just a little bit of light out. So maybe it makes a 2.8 lens and F4, but, and you don't lose a ton of quality. So that's not a very big trade-off, but like a 2X converter, um, again, I've never used 2X actually, but all the examples that I've seen, the, the image quality is degraded and the photos are softer and you lose light. So like, I think an F 2.8 lens becomes like F 6.3 or F 8. I can't remember. Um, you know, so you have to use a faster or a slower shutter speed and just causes all, causes all kinds of problems. So I don't recommend them. I think that it's best if you can just get a longer lens, but that being said, if you can just take a little small teleconverter with you and basically create two lenses from one, if you're hiking or something, then I think that's a no brainer. Okay. Thank you. So another question from Griffin, when your image gets shared widely on social media, do you find that uh, that's a result of your hashtag and tagging account for just getting picked up by, by feature account because of the works is high quality or a bit of both? Okay. So this is a great question. Um, so there's a thousand different reasons why this can happen. And sometimes I get photos reposted by accounts that require the use of a hashtag and I didn't even use their hashtag. So at the end of the day, if the account likes your photo, they're going to share it, whether you use their hashtag or not. Um, also tagging accounts is another way. So like you use your hashtag for that big feature page. That's one way for them to find your photo. Tagging them in the photo is a second way. Again, it's a numbers thing. So the more potential interactions you have with that account, and they can see your photo, the more chances that they're gonna see it and repost it. Um, another great way to increase the amount of features that you get is to network with the moderators. So a lot of these big pages have their moderators listed in their bios, or you know, you'll just stumble across, you know, the maybe like the, the page mentions in the actual post, right? So like on Earth Focus, and this isn't a good example because they don't do this, but maybe you know they post photo by and then selected by so and so in the caption and right there this moderator has tagged themselves in that post and this is a way for them to also gain exposure for themselves through these big pages through the posts that they curate so find the moderators and uh follow them comment you know be nice network with them like in a genuine way not like in a selfish way and that increases your chances as well um but yeah, I think that it's like a little bit of luck and a little bit of like strategy. Okay. Um, question from Andrew. How do you decide which hashtag to use since you can only use like 30 in Instagram? Sure. So 
Instagram is a tricky beast and this algorithm that, you know, they have in place, I've been fighting for like, you know, the past couple of years, ever since they changed how like the feed is not chronological. Um, and I've been figuring stuff out, you know, with this hashtags and thinking that I understand how something works and then, you know, something will happen and a photo will flop and like it does the opposite of what it just did. So it's hard. I don't really know like of a dedicated strategy, but you can always search. So like Google, if you Google Utah hashtags, you'll see a list of a lot of hashtags come up. So my personal strategy is I'll use very popular hashtags like earth focus, beautiful destinations, these posts, you know, but these hashtags have 25 million or something crazy. So I'll use some really popular ones and also some very, niche specific ones as well um maybe like utah sunset is an example so maybe you use utah and utah sunset and then utah sunset maybe has a thousand posts or probably more than that um and then utah has like millions right so like i i, I interchange them and i mix popular ones with less popular ones and i have a theory that this helps you to to rank better on the hashtags you'll show up more often in the in the top posts so that's just my theory though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Someone on, on, on the YouTube asked about um, the focus stacking when you have the, the close object and when you have the, the far object, how do you do the focus stacking? Yeah. So a lot of these cameras today, and this is something like I just mentioned in my mirrorless camera, I have this feature called focus shifting where I focus on the very closest part uh, in the frame to my shot. And I just click a button and the camera literally will take a picture, shift focus, take a picture, shift focus, and it will repeat this all the way to the background. So that is very helpful. That's a Nikon and Canons. I don't know about Fuji, but I know that Sony doesn't have this feature, which is very disappointing um, considering that they're leading in like the mirrorless world. It's kind of funny that they don't have this feature, but that's how you do it if you have it in camera. And if you don't have it in camera, you just have to manually focus on the closest point in the frame and then slowly shift it over till you get all the way to the very uh, background. So the way that I do this is I, I shift, I focus all the way to the closest point, And then I make a visual kind of, um, I guess like I make, vis I visualize steps between that point and the little focus window and the infinity sign. And I'll just do like little incremental turns till I get to the infinity sign where I know that I have my background shot too. So. It's usually like five to seven shots, I think is like a good range. And if your aperture is higher, so maybe you have like, if you're doing this, you wanted to have it, your aperture like F11, right? You don't want to be at F2.8 or your focus width, you know, this, the difference between every shot's going to, you're going to need like a hundred shots, right? So the wider your focal plane from a higher aperture is going to help that as well. Okay, so question from Andrea, what is the best image sizing for Instagram versus printing? Resolution and resize to fit for Instagram. Yeah, so for printing, I just save it full resolution of the size of the image and at 300 DPI. So that's going to be print quality. And then for Instagram, I save for web, which converts it to uh, 72 DPI, which is not noticeable difference on a screen versus when you print it. But usually I post four by five vertical shots on Instagram if I can, because these photos take up more of the screen of your phone or the viewer's phone. And I actually, I believe personally, and this is kind of a well-known fact that vertical images do better on social media because of that fact that they take up more of the phone. They're more visually striking because they appear larger. So um, I do four by five crop and I do 2,400 pixels on the tall end I save for web at 100% quality, and I usually do some sharpening in my editing workflow, which helps the um, sharpen on the screen when you post. Okay, so question from Ruben: Which which Nikon camera has the fo focus shifting? Yeah, so it started in the D850, which was the you know it's the DSLR, which is still a very beastly, amazing camera, but then. After that, it was introduced into the mirrorless cameras. So the Z7, Z5, and Z6 have it. And then also their newest DSLR, the D780, also has it as well. So basically all their new cameras. Okay. Um, any more question? If not, then John, do you have anything to, to say? 
<laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, like uh, Dr. Lynn mentioned, I have a course. If you guys, you know, think this was helpful and you want to further, you know, continue on your learning journey, check out the course. I think uh, you mentioned you put it the link. That's awesome. And I really appreciate that. And then also I mentioned this editing panel, check that out. Um, if you connect with me on Instagram, there's, you won't be able to not find it. I'm going to be posting about it, you know, in the next couple of days when I release it. So um, yeah. yeah, other than that, just thanks for showing up and spending the night Monday evening with us. <laughs> Uh, let me go to your Instagram and put a link on the chat room. Dang, yeah, just, yeah. So just that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> you need you need people. You need the network and find people that promote you. And <laughs> and I appreciate it. Man. Yeah. So remember to check out his Instagram. Okay. This is what you have to do after you after we end this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So one more question from. Um, from Sue. Hey, John, how do you scout for an unknown location? Mm, unknown. Unknown. Yeah. Okay. So this is going back to the Google earth. That's a great tool. Um, you can literally scour the depths of earth with this thing. You could find a remote location in Antarctica if you wanted to just by looking on this map and then finding a unique, like, mountain for example or something and then figuring out where a road is you know how you could hike and then researching the location you could, you could go to a place that hasn't been photographed i mean it's probably hard to do these days because you know so many places are discovered and photographed and documented but yeah that would be my biggest word of advice is google earth and also just going and exploring um, in person, you know, you can find, it's hard to find something unique these days. Let me just say that. Like I, I have found stuff that I thought was unique and then see somebody else post a photo from there. And I think that they copied me and then like, I get all like upset. And then I look and they posted that photo the first time, two years before that, you know, and then I'm like, what, you know, like, you know, I thought that I was copied, but I actually copied them unknowingly, you know? So like, it's hard to find something unique uh, mm -hmm. these days, but not impossible. Yep, not impossible. I agree. Okay, so um, question from Andrew. Any advice for the caption on social media? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's funny, man. That's difficult. I... I just wing it, honestly. I, there's all different types of strategies. Some people like to tell stories. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a good strategy if you tell a story about the image. Um, photos make people feel something. So if you can further that feeling with a story, right, then um, you connect with the viewer and you can, you know, form a connection through that, through the photo and the caption or the story. So I think that's a good way, a good strategy. Um, but I'm all across the board. I'll tell a story. I might use a quote, I might make a joke or something, or just, you know, I might literally just put Diamond Beach 2018. I mean, I'm just all, all across the board. <laughs> I don't think there's any rhyme or reason. Um, I think a lot of people will suggest that you stay consistent with it, um, but I don't. And it hasn't really been a problem for me as far as I can tell. So, yeah, I, I used to tell a story, uh, like, I used to tell the fun fact people like it like the post that I put, uh, I put on Facebook today I just tell people how many traffic lie on Faroe Islands <laughs> nice yeah <laughs> yeah people, people like it yeah that's a good that's a good strategy yeah. right mm -hmm. make yep. the viewer feel connected like they're there like they they're part of it right yeah give them some information make yeah. them a better person from interacting with your post right yeah yeah, there are five traffic light on Faroe Island. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> and Singapore is smaller than the Faroe, but there are 2,800 traffic light in Singapore. That, <laughs> I need to see the Faroes. Okay. Yeah. We're not allowed in the Faroes yet. Not yet. Oh. It's been high on my list forever. Mm -hmm. And 
were just posting some of your photos in the slideshow towards the end. That's mm-hmm. like they're amazing. So yeah. mm-hmm. I get there myself. Yeah, let's hope we can travel again. Let's hope the earth get back to normal again soon. I hope so. Yeah. The new normal. Yep. Okay. The, the let's take the last question. Okay. Um. So, what online gallery, if you, if any, do you use to deliver the picture to your client? Yeah. So I use uh I use Google Drive and I use Smug Mug. So the reason I use Smug Mug is because I sell prints through that website and it's hands off. So they the website's attached to uh, Print Lab. I use Bay Photo and it's hands off, right? So like. I have my images uploaded into full resolution, uh, print ready on this website, and then people can buy them and it's drop shipped. So that's one reason I use Smug Mug. But the other reason is for client galleries. So let's say that, you know, I just did this uh, job with Arizona Tourism Board, for example. I would upload all the photos in a private gallery on my website through Smug Mug. And it's a unique link, so only they can view them, and then they nobody can download them either. You can set it to where, you know, nobody can download, or they can download them if they want. Uh, you can watermark them so that people can't screenshot them. Um, so that's what I use for like the most control. Now, as far as delivery goes, you can do the same thing. You can just create a gallery um, that people can just download, or you can use Google Drive and just you know Google Drive them gigs and gigs of of. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I think that's it for tonight. Once again, thank you, John. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. And students, so before you go to bed today, remember to check out (laughs) John's Instagram and and his tutorial online. Okay, (laughs) so so on behalf of of Nisi Filter, thank you, everyone. I will see you guys next next month. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Good night, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.